Now, as we begin to start this brand new series, and as you guys are getting all settled in with your groups, I wanna ask you about movies. Now, I know we all have a, a favorite genre we tend to, to, to lean towards. Like I know some of my guys in my group, you, you like Marvel movies. Uh, how many of you are in that boat in your, in your small group? Just raise your hand if that's you, if you're in a Marvel or any kind of hyped up like superhero movie. Uh, or, or maybe maybe a Disney like cartoon animated stuff. Like how many of you are, are more Disney in that realm of things? Or, or maybe a rom-com, romantic comedy, or AKA chick flicks. It is the month of love after all. Um, how about like scary movies? Halloween's your favorite time of year because you absolutely love a good scare. You wanna get your friends together, turn all the lights out, stay up late, and scare yourself with scary movies. We all love movies and there's there's something about the story of them that draws us in. Sure, stunning visuals are good, laughs are good, but, but at the bottom line, it's the story that will make or break a movie for us. Now, and thinking about movies, uh, we all love the trailers, right? I, I, at least I do, back when movie theaters were more open and, and you would go over to watch a movie, you'd get all comfy in your seat. Chelsea's like, oh, we can take our time because it doesn't matter about the, the previews. And, and I'm like, no, we've got to get there in time for the previews because I want to see all the trailers, right? We love trailers because there's something about the big, you know, the screen going black, it's like and then epic and sound effects and there's always that the bass drop that just like gets you all hyped up and then the how many of you you've, you've been in a theater and you've watched a trailer and the trailer ended and you're like I've got to see that movie and maybe maybe it was it was a, a one-liner in that romantic comedy that just it just it's funny and so so you want to see it you want to see what happens and see where that story goes you want to see what happens uh, um, or, or maybe it's the action trailer that just leaves you on a cliffhanger or whatever it is or the scary movie that leaves you like wanting to know how it ends. How does it resolve? What's the thrill? Trailers leave us with a sense of more. We, we want to see more because the trailer, you know, can't give you the whole story in the two minutes, neither should it. You want to go and see it after you watch the trailer. That's the purpose of them. But sometimes trailers get it wrong. They do give you too much. They give too much away. How many of you, you've gone to see a movie because the trailer looked so good, but all the good parts were just in the trailer and the actual movie itself wasn't that great. We've all been there and, and, and it's not a fun feeling. And the reality is in our culture, there's lots of things that are talked about that you, you almost see the trailer for. The conversations are just the sneak peek into all the complicated facets that go into that conversation or into that topic. And so we hear the cliff notes. We hear the sneak peek, the trailer version of a lot of issues in our culture, but we don't always have the big picture, we don't always have the full story. And there's very often way more to the full story than what we just see in the trailers of our cultural conversations. One of those conversations and what we'll be talking about this entire series is about sex. And I get it, bringing up this topic in church can sometimes feel a little uh, a little awkward maybe. Um, but, but to be honest, that's one of the main reasons we're in small groups right now and not with large groups because I feel like having this kind of conversations within small groups opens the door to be able to have this conversation uh, a little more uh, openly uh, than maybe we could if we were in a large group gathering. And I say this almost every year, but the reason we have this conversation in church at all is because you don't have to think really hard to recognize that singers sing about it and rappers rap about it. Netflix shows certainly don't avoid it. It's plastered everywhere on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok. Even magazines in the checkout line at the grocery store talk about sex on the cover. Movies and performers use sex as a selling point. It's taught about in your schools. It's joked about with your friends. And some of you wish that your families would stop trying to have this conversation. And maybe some of you, if you've seen the trailers for how this conversation is talked about within church settings, maybe you get the idea that, well, hey, God seems to be really concerned about our sex lives. In fact, maybe based off those previews or those trailers, you've gotten the idea that God hates sex. That's the story. Or maybe God's mad about sex and that's the story. Or maybe that God only cares about virginity and that's the end of the story. But then if that's true, then that brings up a whole bunch of other questions like, is it bad that I'm thinking about it? Is it bad if I want to do it? Can I do everything but actual sex? I know people who've had sex and they're not dead, so is it really that big of a deal? Maybe you're thinking, well, I've had sex, so does that mean that I'm doomed forever? 
What if it wasn't my choice and somebody else made that choice for me? What does God think about that? What am I supposed to do now? Or maybe even questions like, I can't even get a guy or a girl interested in me. So trust me, I'm not gonna be getting any anytime soon. So can I just skip church for the next few weeks? And I get it, this, this is kind of a, a loaded topic, okay? There's lots of previews, lots of sneak peeks about how this is supposed to look in our culture today. Lots of conversations about how everywhere else as we mentioned. And so there's a lot of baggage going into this conversation to even begin with. So if there's anything that I can stress to you as we begin this conversation in week one of this series, it's this, that when it comes to God's plan for sex, there is more to the story. So here's what's amazing. Sex is as old as mankind, and so we can go back thousands of years to the times of Scripture in the Bible to, to see what people had to say about this topic, and we can actually glean lots of insight about our lives today because of what people have recorded all throughout history and because of what we believe God's Word has to say about how we should actually live our lives, especially when it comes to this topic. 2,000 years ago when Paul was still alive and he was going around and telling people about Jesus, planting churches, writing letters to them, the letters he wrote which we have now collected in our New Testament, and Paul had planted a church in Corinth and he was writing to the church in Corinth. And, and what, what you need to understand is that Corinth back in the day was kind of a, a hub where people would pass through on their way to other places. It was kind of like the Vegas of today, known for being the place that you can stop, party, and misbehave before you go on your way. Kind of what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. So actually, I guess as you think about it, 2,000 years ago, it doesn't sound a whole lot different from today. So as Christianity was new and Christians were you know, filled with all kinds of questions about how God wants them to live when it comes to all kinds of things, Paul writes to them and he, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what he says. I have the right to do anything. That's an interesting way to start a conversation. And in fact, uh, he's actually quoting a common phrase that was said in Corinth, kind of like the Vegas thing, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This was kind of a Corinthian phrase. I have the right to do anything. I do what I want, in other words. So Paul begins with this idea in mind. He says, I have the right to do anything, but he continues. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul speaks right to the Corinthian culture and he says, just because you can do anything doesn't mean that you should do anything. And this speaks right to the heart of that culture as well as our culture today, especially when you think about it in regards to this topic of sexuality. Now, when Paul was writing this, he was writing to a bunch of Jews who were her, who had questions about what they should eat, what they should not eat, uh, because there were Jewish restrictions on what was clean or unclean. And, and Paul is saying, hey, because of Jesus, we're not bound to that part of the old law anymore because that covenant has now been fulfilled. I know there's questions, there's things you, you can do, but it doesn't mean that you should do, especially specifically in this sense, if you're in the presence of other Jews who hold that conviction that still feel like they shouldn't eat those things. But even though Paul's example in this sense was in regards to food, it's completely applicable to all parts of our lives, including sexuality. And just because you can do something and get away with it, just because you can do something and it's not culturally frowned upon, just because you can do something doesn't mean you necessarily should. Freedom doesn't equate with right or good. Normal doesn't mean okay. In fact, a better question than how, how much is too much, how far is too far, how close to the line can I get, a better way of thinking is, is it best for me? In fact, learning to think about what is best over what is just simply normal is part of becoming a mature person. But wait, there's more to the story. Whether you are sexually active or thinking of someone sexually or consuming sexual content on a screen, there's almost always more than just you involved. There's almost always another person involved. There's lots of different 
ways that we could get into that. Most of those you could think of yourself. But the point is you and I can't only think about what's best for ourselves. We have to think about what's best for the other person, what's best for those around us, what's best even for society as a whole. And if you're a Christian, this way of thinking isn't really even optional. Jesus calls us, we have to think about other people. We have to think about bigger ramifications just beyond ourselves and our own self-interests. If we get this right, as Christians, we should go further into asking not only is this what's best for me, but is this best for them? We should have a we mindset, a we mentality, not just a me. When asked about what was most important, Jesus gave the answer to love your neighbor as yourself. And look, something may feel good in the moment, but if you look to the future, if you look beyond that moment, if you look at the relational ramifications for what you're doing or the future of the person you're doing it with, then you're forced to ask the question, is this best in the long run? And if you've not made a, a forever commitment to that person through marriage, then you can't really know if it's best for the future. And therefore you can't really justify, oh, well, it's okay for me or it's okay for them. It, it's mutual. There's mutual consent. We've got to have a higher standard than that. We've actually talked about that already, so I, I might actually link that in this video and you can go watch that one later. And look, Jesus was so clear about what God was like. How you treat other people and how they treat you is a big deal to him. And so God doesn't hate sex. He doesn't want to take things from you, but he does want you to live your life in such a way that it is in line with the way that he has designed things to be, both relationally and, and for your own heart. And here's the thing. Your dating lives and your sex lives will be better if you adhere to the way that God has designed for you to live. I promise you. And you don't know how I know? Because this is what everyone truly wants. May not feel like it in the moment, but I promise you, hear me out. We all want to be in a relationship where each person looks out for the interests of the other person. And you may be asking, well, what if the interests of both people are to have sex? And that's a valid question. But if you think beyond the moment, statistically speaking, how likely are you to still be dating that person a year from now? It's not very high. That may sound cold, but that's just a reality. And if you've not made a lifelong commitment to that person within the context of marriage, then you can't really guarantee that you are thinking in the best interest of the person that you're with. I mean, you probably haven't even decided fully where you're gonna go to college yet. You haven't made the decisions for your future yet that you would even be able to know if you have the capacity to make a lifelong commitment to somebody. How awkward will that relationship be with that person once you've broken up? And if you think about it logically, the person that you want to marry, how would you feel if their sexual preferences or desires or experiences were comprised of somebody else, of what they've done with other people, of what they desire to do? When we think about our future spouse's sexual history, it makes us uncomfortable. And when you're at a point where you are ready for marriage and you have to have some of those difficult conversations, you want your potential spouse to feel as much comfort from you knowing your past as possible. Not to have to have worries or doubts because of maybe some past experiences that you've had. I know that's kind of deep for week one, but the point I'm trying to make is logically speaking, you can't know what is best for the person that you're with. And so you probably don't want to make lifelong commitment actions if you haven't actually made the commitment itself. I know that's a little heavy. For some of you, that makes perfect sense. For others of you, that goes over your head. And that, that honestly, it's fine right now because uh, I've talked about this in a little bit more detail in, in years past. And you can go back and you can watch those if you want. The point I'm trying to make in this lesson is a little bit different from the point that I usually make when we start out these kinds of series. And that is that just because you can do something, you have the freedom to do something, something is culturally acceptable for you to do, does not make it right, does not make it beneficial, and does not make it good. It does not make it best. The true standard for, and this, this applies to all areas of life, especially this area, but in, in every area that our culture has really gotten away from, even within the church at times, is that there has to be a standard of authority that rules over our lives other than what we feel in the moment and other than what the culture is saying. In other words, we have to have a place where we get our answers that is bigger than ourselves. And as Christians, we believe that that is found in God's Word. 
So the, the real question when it comes to everything, but especially this topic, is what does God have to say about it? Because whether or not we like it or not, that's the standard we have to live to. That's what we have to answer to. And if we want to be the kind of people that looks to the best interests of others over ourselves, then we can't get around that. We have to live the way that Jesus says is the best way to be kind, to look out for the best interests of others. And when it comes to sexual integrity, that's something that we can all choose to have. Now, in the past, not necessarily at this church, but as a culture, as a Christian culture, so I'm talking about the subculture of Christianity within the larger context of our culture, this conversation has been greatly centered around the idea of purity. And I understand it because, you know, God says He wants us to remain pure for Him. And we've kind of taken that and we've, we've introduced shame in ways that I don't know is, is necessary. And some of you may feel like, well, maybe that choice was made for me. Or maybe I've made mistakes in the past. Or maybe I can't get over this addiction. Therefore, I no longer can have sexual purity. And therefore, it's kind of a waste for me to keep trying. That's the kind of logic that, that has been used and applied to the subject in the past. And I don't release you from that because I used the phrase sexual integrity a minute ago. And, and, and by sexual integrity, I mean that we want to be a, a people that lives by the stain, same standards, that, that our actions follow our words, and that what we believe to be true, we actually live out, regardless of mistakes we've made in the past. We want to have integrity in every year, in, in every area. And when it comes to sexual integrity, that is a decision we can make each and every day to live with sexual integrity. We want to be the kind of people that have, have academic integrity, that have integrity in our friendships and in the way that we have conversations and talk about other people. We want to have integrity with the, our words. We don't want to be liars. And the same goes true for sexuality. We want to have integrity when it comes to our sexuality. And everyone can and should have sexual integrity regardless of what has happened in the past or decisions that we've made. Sexual integrity is about way more than just saving yourself until marriage or, or feeling guilty if you don't. It's about choosing to honor God by honoring others with the way that you think and treat sexuality with the way that we value this gift of sexuality that God has given us and wants us to have without any guilt or strings attached. And that starts with now and, and what you consume and, and how you treat the people that you date. And some of you rule followers, I know that you're just wanting me to draw a line and say, you know, you, the sexual integrity means this. You can't do this or you can't do that. Uh, you must do this. And, and and while there might be a time and a place for, for getting specific, I want to I wanna steer the conversation away from any kind of lines that we're going to draw because when we start drawing lines, we start trying to figure out how we can jump over them. And I don't want your mind to go there right now. I want you to start asking yourself the question, what is best? What's best for myself and what's best for those around me? So how does one truly have sexual integrity? How does one make decisions that are best for themselves and for others. A couple things that you can start doing. One is you can talk to God about who you really want to be. Invite Him into the story of your life. There is so much more to the story when it comes to this topic, and we're just barely scratching the surface today, but invite Him into your story when it comes to this topic specifically. It might seem awkward at first, but he loves you and he wants to show you the way that this is supposed to be experienced so that you can get the best fulfillment out of it. Even if maybe you would consider yourself a baby Christian or new to faith or maybe even not sure you have a faith, I encourage you to try this. What else do you have to lose? Talk with God about this and about who you really want to be. Think about that in the long term. We're not great at that because we're a minute by minute culture, but think into the future. When you look at yourself 10 years from now, what does that look like? And what kind of scars or muscles do you want to have when it comes to your sexual integrity? And secondly, I want you to talk to someone about how you you plan on becoming that person it's not good enough to just talk to God and keep it between yourself and him you got to bring other people into it and a lot of times God speaks to us through the people he puts in our lives I promise you're not gonna freak out your small group leader you're not gonna freak out me we've all heard it all before 
This is, this is not a new topic and it's not something new to high schoolers or Christians. We all face temptation, we all struggle with stuff and if you feel like you need to hide something, then I just wanna encourage you that you're, you're not gonna surprise anyone, you're not gonna be judged and, and odds are there's gonna be a lot of people who can relate with you. The thing about integrity is integrity is something that you rarely feel the need to have to hide. Having integrity means you can talk openly about what you feel and just be the real you. You can be authentic. Oftentimes trying to hide things and trying to filter things um, does not lead the way for true integrity. It just teaches us better how to put on a double face. And as Christians, we want to be people of integrity in all areas of our lives. So I get that this conversation is a little bit complicated and there's way more to the story when it comes to God's plan for sex and sexuality. And so I want you to, to turn to your small group right now and begin some of the discussion and thinking along these lines that what is the part of the story that maybe I'm missing right now? What's the part of the story that God wants to teach me and how can I invite God into my story when it comes to this topic? I love you guys and I hope to see you back next week for week two in this series. I love you and have a great Valentine's Day and a great week.